Um, about automobiles and India's, let's say, love affair or India's passion for the automobile, I think it's something which is rather special and quite unusual. And I've already written a book about this, which was published last year by Penguin. Uh, but um, let me kind of explain a bit more on that. And in fact, that's what makes it a bit different in the case of India versus the rest of the world. Um, as you might know that in India, uh, in the world today, there are, as you know, there are well above more than 190 countries, uh, but only 22 of them actually are made, are making cars, are manufacturing cars. The rest are all consumers. And in fact, the, of course, the 22 countries also consume automobiles. And so do these other countries, 170 odd, which are essentially importing and selling cars and, and cars are being sold in their countries. Now, amongst these 22, if you look at it historically, if you look at it before the war, before the Second World War, essentially five car making nations existed. The five countries in the world which led the whole business of ma making automobiles. And that was, of course, the US. And in Europe, it was um, essentially the UK, France, Germany, and Italy. And these five countries um, are the ones which were the main car makers uh, till until I would say the 1950s or 1960s. Um, Japan in the post-war situation, they did make the first cars before that, but they really started making automobiles in a, let's say in a serious fashion uh, only in the 50s and 60s and started exporting them in the 60s. And then uh, Japan has become, is now to recognized as one of the uh, major car making nations. Uh, by the 80s, in fact, they were number one. They had overtaken the US, and uh, today they're number three. And then there's South Korea, which also got into the business of making cars much later, only in the, 50, in the 60s, assembling cars and finally manufacturing, I would say, more in the 1970s. And today is a major automobile manufacturing nation. Of course, the country which makes the maximum number of cars today in the world, and that's China. It's a very, very new entry. China got into making cars barely 20, 25 odd years ago. They had made a few before that for, let's say, official purposes, but they're not consequential. What started making is really seriously into car manufacturing, barely two or decades old ago. And, um, and in fact, more than a decade, a decade back, they became the number one car making nation in the world. And so today you have China as number one, USA is number two, Japan is the third biggest. It was the number one, it slipped to number three. And it could slip to fourth because the country that's really on the ascendance when it comes to automobile car making, car manufacturing is India, which is now the fourth largest car man manufacturer in the world. And um, in terms of or vehicles, if you take two wheelers into account, not only is India the number one in the world um, uh, you know, uh, for, for the manufacturing of, let's say, motorized two wheelers, ahead of China, though this, this point is a bit, it can be discussed, but that we're not getting into that. But the fact is that if you combine cars, I mean, two wheels, three wheels, four wheels, everything, all wheels that are being made, uh, India is probably number two to China. So it's become a fairly significant car making nation. And, uh, you know, the talk of make in India, if there's one industry that is really doing well in terms of being, making things in India, that's the automobile industry. Yet before that, there is a long history and India's history itself is what is unusual. The number one country in the world, China, for car making, for manufacturing automobiles, uh, has very little history, virtually no history. You know, before, uh, before, before 2000 or before, uh, in, uh, before that, there were very few cars, if at all, were um, available in China and uh, very few survive, in fact, that's the other point I'll come to much later. The fact that China today um, has a policy which makes sure that they crush all vehicles which are more than 15 years old. So they make sure that nothing survives. So they have no history. That's it for China. It comes to Japan, which is the number two. Japan does have a history. Japan did make cars. Actually, they started making the first car was made in 1918 as a joint venture, as a collaboration with Mitsubishi and Fiat. And then subsequently, there were other makers also. Toyota started making cars in the 1930s. But most of the vehicles from before the Second World War, nothing of that really survived. Very little survives because um, there were not very many made, not very many imported. And most of them were probably destroyed during the bombing of the Second World War and subsequently. And very little of that survives. 
Japan today has a is seen as a fairly significant um, car loving nation. They are they they have quite a movement for historic vehicles, but that's a that makes it makes Japan a bit unusual in the Asian context. Within Asia, that way where India has an extraordinary history. There were a lot of automobiles that were imported before the Second World War. And surprisingly enough, many of them do survive. A lot of them do survive today. So there is a strong history there. And then we build up our own industry, uh, despite whatever, we were, we're not getting into politics, but despite whatever happened in the 50s and 60s, India did build, created the base for an industry, which today makes it one of the largest in the world. And, uh, and has its history, its industrial history of the automobile also. So along with this, I think India's love affair with the automobile has been rather unusual, unique, and really special, uh, very different from anywhere else in Asia, and quite on par with, I would say, or at least in terms of important significance uh, with, the, with, with nations like, uh, like, like the West, uh, like Europe and North America, uh, where obviously, of course, the number of historic vehicles in these countries are, are huge and massive compared to what it is in India. But India's role, let's say, let's say India's, India's, let's say, action or activities, or India as an actor, as an actor in the historic vehicle movement or in the historic vehicle world or the, or the history of the automobile has been really significant, unusually so for a country out of Asia. And, um, and, and in fact, outside of Europe and outside of America, North and South America, I think India is one of the most significant uh, histories in the, in, the, in the sphere of the automobile. So for that, I think to explain, to give you this, I wanted to give you this background before the presentation, which basically, you know, I'm lazy. So I let the presentation do most of the uh, talking and I let that run and um, I will kind of add a few words. And after the presentation, again, I would like to kind of, let's say summarize. And then I think more interesting is to have a chat with all of you. So, let me get the so okay so here it is so it's about india's automotive heritage uh, of course before the automobile what india had were like that like the rest of the world a whole lot of animal drawn uh, let's say carriages and vehicles like that and the first vehicle that seems to have the first automobile that may have come into india is the one by Mah maharaja rajinder singh of patiala was supposed to have imported a Dedio Bhutto steam car in 1892. It's not, there's not very clear evidence. There's some information about that. It's part of the records of the Maharaja Patiala's uh, archives. Uh, but obviously no photographs or nothing from that remains. This is uh, the photograph I've used is something else from some other similar vehicle. There's also this talk of the fact that there was a, um, 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 uh, um, Oldsmobile exported and Olds exported from the US in 1893 and the ship in which it was arriving, which was traveling, sank. And so it didn't make it to India. So it's in fact the record of the first time a vehicle was exported out of the US and first time a vehicle sank. But there's some problem with that record because it says 1893, whereas Olds started making cars in 1897. So there's always a problem with these kind of certain historical facts and figures and, you know, something that goes around sometimes, which is not quite correct. Um, I should also at the same time uh, explain to you about the fact that there were these early cars that came in were mostly French, in fact. And uh, this was an example of a Chenard de Vacker, which was used by the Maharaj of Santosh. So, you know, from football Santosh Trophy, that is the Maharaja it's named after. A very early Renault that you see from 19... In fact, it would be from after 1908, though it's right, 1906 there, that's not quite correct. This is a vehicle from, uh, which was made, which went into manufacture in 1908. So it's a vehicle from after 1908, which is in Calcutta and is still in a regular running fashion for, for, the, for the Statesman Rally in Calcutta. This is a vehicle that shows up every now and then. This is also a vehicle which used to be in Calcutta at Dirac. Uh, again, another uh, French vehicle, though this was probably the one which was assembled in the UK. And then it came into India. And this Dirac uh, is in Mumbai, to be more exact, and is uh, used to be a part of the Dr. Vijay Malia's collection. Uh, presumably, it's still there as part of the collection. So the Dirac was one of them. Of course, the most important or most freaky cars that came in the early part of India's automotive history was this Swan car, uh, 
which was not brought in by Maharaja, but by this uh, Scottish gentleman called Scotty uh, Mathewson, who went and got this vehicle designed and developed to, the, to his ideas and thinking of what a car should be, shape of a swan. Why? Well, nobody exactly knows, but it's one of the strange vehicles. It survives actually at the moment in at the Hague in a museum called the Laumann Museum in, uh, in the Netherlands. And then there were these coach builders in India, like the one in Calcutta, Stewart and Company, which dates back to 1775. We're making um, coaches, carriages for, um, for horse-drawn carriages. And later on, they were putting bodies on cars. They were importing Thornycraft um, and other cars, and they were putting bodies on them and supplying it to India, to the customers in India. And of course, it was when the Maharajas and Rajas got into the business of wanting to have cars is when things really became crazy in India. And of them, some you know, there were some, well, not necessarily to the best of taste, I would say this particular Rolls Royce, which was all adorned as it would have been by a certain Maharaja at that period of time. And uh, so, so this passion for the automobile is when the, the Rajas and the Maharajas discovered the automobile. And uh, before you knew what was happening, some of the most ostentatious vehicles came into India. On the left, you see a Rolls Royce, which was used as a throne car by the, by the Nizam of Hyderabad. The car still exists in Hyderabad. And on the right is a vehicle, a Daimler, which was gold painted and plated. All the chrome work was in gold and stuff like uh, painted and plated in gold uh, by a certain um, uh, merchant in, um, in Indore. Uh, and by a said G. And this is, so, yet at the same time, there were some great vehicles, some very unusual and very brilliant vehicles in, imported into India. It's Farman. Farman used to make aircrafts. In fact, Farman also made the airways, which became Air France eventually, um, a French company. And they made these cars, which was at that time, the absolutely the most expensive and leading edge. They made barely a hundred vehicles in 10 years. And this is only four survive. And this is one of them, the Farman, which was brought in by the Maharaj of Vidar. Here's a Delage, which was imported by the, by the, by the uh, Maharaj of Indore, a Figoni bodied car, beautiful car from 1930, which was um, at the London Motor Show. The Maharaj saw that, liked it very much, brought the car into India, and it's one of the most uh, special cars. It's, uh, it's one of the high performance cars from the 30s. This Rolls Royce 17EX, which was an experimental car, which Rolls had developed specifically to make some of the fastest cars of its time, uh, later on was bought by the Maharaj of Kashmir. And since then, it's been in, it was in India for many years. Several uh, princely families owned it, other families did. It's gone abroad. Today, it's in Vienna. And it is one of the best known cars out of India, which has been going to all the most prestigious events. And it wasn't only the Maharajas who had great cars. There was this family in Calcutta, for instance, that Rolls Royce that you saw is in the middle of this, these five cars here, right in the middle. On flanking it are two Duesenbergs. And then there are two Mercedes SS, which was the fastest car at its time, at that point of time in, in the world. These five cars today, if they were around in any collection, would be worth, I don't know, 25, 30, 40 million dollars, 250 crores or more. There was someone like J.R.D. Tata, who again had great taste and who imported a Bugatti Type 35A with which he used to race in Mumbai on Marine Drive. There are photographs from this is at Burley Seafest, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where they, they used to have sprint events. And this is the Bugatti Type 35A that he used to have, which he, which he raced. And uh, similarly, they were not necessarily the Maharajas, more, more the educated, the lawyers and others who, let's say, were the best at, I mean, brought in some of the finest cars, some of the most tasteful cars, some of the most exceptional automobiles at that point of time. And uh, so that's the reason why um, a book like this, the, which I wrote on the Maharajas and their motor cars has been quite successful simply because um, I think the association of the Maharajas and the princely India with that of the automobile has always been something that's been very special that everybody has always been fascinated by. On the other side, there was also this attempt to try and make cars in India. And uh, though this is not the first, I have we have photographs of an evidence of a car being made in Calcutta, uh, garage operation. I would imagine that this car, the base, must have been something that was already there. 
It's probably not something that's been ground up brand new. And probably the, board, the gentleman actually boarded the vehicle and decided to, but it was only after independence. Sorry, my mistake. Actually, the first assembling of cars started happening in 1928, 29, late 1930. In fact, 1928 itself, Graham Page were being assembled in Calcutta. This is the General Motors assembly facilities in Mumbai, in Bombay, in, uh, in uh, before the Second World War. Ford also set up assembly facilities in Mumbai, in Bombay, in fact, and in Calcutta and in Madras, and uh, assembled a lot of vehicles during, especially during the time of the Second World War, a lot of vehicles which were being used for the military were assembled at Ford and General Motors facilities. This was India's first, uh, one of India's first factories, or automobile manufacturing facilities were that of Premier Automobiles in uh, Mumbai. And this is where they were, these are the Fiat 600, which were being assembled in, in Mumbai then. Hindustan Motors in Calcutta, of course, set up the factory in Calcutta. And similarly, uh, they were assembling uh, Studebakers. Premier Automobile was assembling Dodge, DeSoto and Plymouth other than Fiat. They had that time uh, signed deals with, um, with, uh, with uh, Chrysler to assemble Dodge, DeSoto and Plymouth and with Fiat to assemble the Fiat cars. And uh, similarly, Hindustan Motors in Calcutta signed deals with uh, Morris, uh, British Motor Corporation for Morris for uh, assembling essentially the Morris vehicles and Studebaker. Fiat, of course, is the a brand that was uh, that became not just the assembling operation, but eventually that is what Premier went into manufacture, localized over a period of time, starting 19, late 1950s from 1959 onwards. And by the 60s, by the end of the 60s, they had localized the Premier, uh, what became the Premier Padmini. It was first the Fiat 1100, then called the Premier President for a short while before it was being called the Premier Padmini. Hindustan Motors, as I was explaining, had signed deals with Studebaker, with the American company called Studebaker to assemble the Studebakers in India, which they kept assembling till 1959. And they also started making, they also signed up a deal with uh, British Motor Corporation to assemble and uh, make the Morris range of cars. Uh, this is the example of a Morris Landmaster. Uh, the, sorry, the Morris uh, Oxford, what is called the Morris Oxford in the UK, but called the Hindustan Landmaster in India. And the Hindustan Landmaster then evolved to what was the Hindustan Ambassador, which Hindustan Motor started assembling from 1957, localized as the Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, as we know them, as the Ambassador Mark I, Mark II, Mark III, till, till 2014, the Ambassador was being made. The third car maker that was there in India at that point of time was uh, Standard Motors Corporation, um, which started making the Standard Herald, uh, made under license from Triumph Herald, another British car manufacturing company. Um, the Standard Herald was made again, decided, it was decided assembling them in 1960s and was assembled till the 1970s, in fact, were made and was called the Standard Kessel. And then, of course, a totally new era started with the Maruti 800. As we know, the Maruti 800 arrived in late 1983 as a joint venture between Maruti and Suzuki. And uh, then from then starts sort of the part two of the auto India's automobile industry, um, and which has gone today to 4 million plus for cars, 20 million plus for two wheelers. That's a different part of the aspect. I would like to come back to also the fact that uh, in India was a very early starter as far as motorsport was concerned. Motorsport, the first event, in fact, if at all recorded, was a reliability run, at just a drive from Calcutta to Barakpur in 1904, where you can see this is the gathering, which is a bit of a casual affair. And, and, and then there were more serious reliability runs between uh, Delhi and Bombay, Bombay to Mahabaleshwar and other ones. But racing in a serious way started uh, in a post-independent situation in 19. 49 or so from Calcutta, where the Calcutta Motorsport Club was formed. And in fact, this car, this Jaguar um, SS 100, or rather it was called the SS 100 Jaguar. It's the first, one of the first uses of the name Jaguar, which um, was used by the company called SS, uh, which changed its name to Jaguar after the Second World War for obvious reasons. That particular car that you saw racing 
in Calcutta in front of the Victoria Memorial today is owned by Jackie Shroff. Uh, it's in Mumbai. It's been restored and it's one of the few, in fact, it's the only SS 100 that's ever been in India that was imported and has ever been in India. And um, it's an extremely rare and car with a terrific history, which remains very much with uh, a person like Jackie Shroff, who's a serious enthusiast. Um, the other car I would talk about from that racing in Calcutta, racing in Calcutta was very, very, there was, there was a lot of activity, a lot of racing in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And um, racing also went to other parts of India, to Sholavaram in the south, to Bombay and Pune and Bangalore too. This particular car, the Lancia Astura that you see, which is here, still survives, survives today. And it's again in Mumbai with a collector called Hari Trivedi. Many of you probably know him. And uh, this car is again a part of India's automotive history, uh, racing history, and it's India's automotive history, a car that has survived, which probably was developed as a racer sometime in the 1930s. The basic chassis is in fact based on a Lancia Astura and one of the very old, one of the earliest Lancia Asturas in the world today. Uh, this car survives. There was a car called the Allard J2, which was in uh, Calcutta 2 and which is smuggled out of India because there's a ban on export of cars from India pre-1960. This car, uh, the Allard from the 1950s, early 50s, uh, which used to race in Calcutta a lot, was smuggled out of India a couple of hardly 20 odd years ago. And today is alive and well in the UK, uh, well documented, and it keeps going to various events. Here is a car, a case of, um, uh, again, part of the same racing history. There is the Citroen that you see, which is a traction armor, which is a car which was used by a Chinese lady called Mini Pan, who used it for, his daily, for a daily drive and a daily use and would go racing on the weekends and would be, was very, very successful as a racer. Behind that, you can see a Studio Baker, big cars, regular, what he called saloon cars of that period, sedan cars of that period, which were being raced. That Citroen still is, survives and is still around. It's in, Cal it's in Delhi and is um, owned and maintained beautifully by uh, an enthusiast whose father, in fact, restored this car. And, um, and, and, and it's part of what I'm, I'm giving these ex as examples of how this is all part of India's automotive history, that there, there were cars which were raised or cars that were owned by princely families or cars that had certain significance, survive today, and are not only being survived, but been taken care of and are being are, are part of our automotive, let's say, cultural history. Here you see is a collection from the well-known collection of Mr. Pranlal Bhogilal. This is at his house in um, Ahmedabad. And um, Bhogilal, for instance, was one of the first of the collectors. And in fact, what happened is with, um, with uh, sometime in the 60s and 70s, many of the uh, Indian enthusiasts realized that these there were values to this vehicle. They were an important part of India's history. And instead of destroying these vehicles, they should preserve them. Many of the cars did leave the country at that point of time. Pranlal Bhogilal, who you see here, uh, who passed away a few years ago, uh, was one of the earliest ones to start collecting, recognizing India's automotive history, start collecting these cars, saving them. In fact, he is the one who convinced um, the Prime Minister at that point of time, Indira Gandhi, to institute the ban on the export of cars. And that's how uh, India has been able to retain um, some of its, quite a, quite a bit of its automotive history. And then there were other collectors today that have come up. Several of them are well known. There are many collectors today. I'm just naming a few. This is the collection that you see of uh, Dalji Titus. Dalji Titus is the person on the right here amongst his cars. There's Dr. Ravi Prakash and his family, his two daughters and his wife who are very much involved with their historic vehicle collection. And that's in Bangalore. Um, it's a 200 plus collection, a bunch of cars which are with great histories. Um, then there are more recent collectors like someone like Johan Punavala, who, as you know, is based in Pune and has built up a collection, which is a fairly recent collection for the last um, 15, 20 years, but a very, very uh, important and uh, very interesting collection with cars which are really significant. Uh, amongst the cars that you see there, then there is a, other Pune family, for instance, um, the uh, Zahir Vakil and his daughter Farah Vakil that you see with their cars. Uh, Zahir also built up quite an exceptional collection. And similarly, there are several other collectors in India today. And I think it would be 
Uh, it's, it's, I mean, I can't, I can't start listing all of them out, but they have done a lot to, let's say, save and preserve and, let's say, uh, keep India's automotive history alive. Along with these collectors have come up the museums. You know, the museums have been, this, some of the collectors have set up museums already. Pranlal Bhogilal, who we talked about, this is his museum in Ahmedabad. And if you happen to be in Ahmedabad, you should. It's little on the outskirts of Ahmedabad and Katiawada. You should go across and see it. There's one near Delhi the Man at Manesar, uh, the Heritage Museum, Transport Museum, which you see on the, light, on the left, built up by Tarun Thakral. An excellent history of India's transport history is there. On the right, you see is the cars or the vehicles from the GD Museum, which is in um, GD Car Museum, which is in Coimbatore in the south. And again, an extremely fine collection there. And then there are these uh, princely families, some of the princely families, most of them, of course, lost their cars or sold them off or didn't really take care of them. Some of them did. And this is a car of, uh, from the Gondal family in Gujarat. Um, so this car was bought by the erstwhile uh, prince or the Maharaja, so-called. Um, and um, he ha he bought the car when he was 18 until and, and he passed away, unfortunately, just last year. The car is still there in the family and so are some 50 odd cars. If you go to Udaipur, again, there is a museum there, which is worth visiting because those are the cars of the princely family of Udaipur. Uh, there are some 20 odd cars there. This one, what you see is a Rolls Royce 20, which went to Pebble Beach. Um, that's only a fraction of what they had obviously acquired over the years, but at least 20 odd of the cars which the princely family of uh, the Meva family of Udaipur had is still there with them and it's part of the museum which you can see and I would like to end this presentation with what I think is the most beautiful one of the most beautiful cars in the country today this is one of the most uh, beautiful cars in the world today I would imagine and that remains with uh, the Maharaj Dal Dalip Singh uh, of Jodhpur uh, it's a car with again an extraordinary history uh, a French car called the De La Haye with a special figurine filashki body, and which I'm showing is an example of what is India's um, strong automotive history um, in terms of uh, classic vintage vehicles, in terms of historic vehicles, and um, you know, in that sort of thing. So, I think I'll I'll come back to um, the to, to talking to you all to show you what what was the history of basically is India's automotive. Uh, let's say. Um, it's a let's say India's um, you know history, which is which which there is uh, there is quite a collection of cars which exist or still survive from before the war. Uh, before we jump, there are several myths, and I'd like to clarify that, and I'd like to kind of stress upon them that um, India was not a huge market for historic vehicles. If you look at it in terms of sheer numbers in India today, there are not very many. I would imagine that vehicles which are more than 50 year old are less than 10,000. Whereas um, in a country like uh, France, where I'm in, I'm in Paris, uh, France itself has probably about half a million or probably more than 700,000 historic vehicles, I think. Uh, UK has almost a million. US is supposed to have as many as 15 million, right? So there are millions of historic vehicles around the world, yet they represent barely, 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 uh, whatever, 0.03% of the uh, vehicle park across the globe, because vehicle park across the globe is over a billion. Uh, and the other thing is that India's numbers are not very large. Yet, in terms of post-war, the vehicle that uh, survive, which are from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, are quite significant. Unfortunately, the government's policy and thinking to crush every vehicle that's more than 15 years old uh, I would imagine would be very harmful for India's to preserve India's history. We are in a, uh, where a khaki is involved in preserving India's history. And I think it's very important to, let's say, convey this message that uh, the recognition of historic vehicles being more than 50 years old is, um, is, is, well, the fact that the government did recognize is the good thing. The bad thing is it's that they recognize vehicles which are more than 50 years old as being historic. Uh, as I'm part of a the international federation called FIVA, which is the Federation of International Vehicles, uh, uh, Federation International de Vehicle Ancien, which is a international federation of what we call historic vehicles around the world. We have more than 80 member countries. And um, FIVA recognizes vehicles which are more than 30 years old as historic. And um, if the Indian government and the Indian 
uh, they do change that, it'll make a big difference. Otherwise, what we're going to do is to crush and lose, I would say, millions and millions dollars or rather hundreds and thousands of crores worth of our historic vehicle, uh, let's say, uh, park. We will lose it. And I think it's very important and imperative that uh, the government and the people concerned should rethink this. At the same time, the numbers are very small because I was coming to the fact about something, but one of the myths, for instance, everyone talks about as about Rolls Royces. The fact that Rolls Royce, people think that India was a very important market for Rolls Royce, uh, which isn't untrue. India was a very important market in terms of uh, not numbers, but in terms of its importance. Um, Rolls Royce made about more than 20,000 cars uh, by, the sec by the start of the Second World War, you know, by 1940. Before 1940, it made about 20,000 cars, of which barely 900 came to India. So in terms of sheer numbers, um, the US, the UK, of course, most of Western European countries, many other countries in the world were probably more important in India um, than uh, one would imagine. But each time they sold a car to a Maharaja, they made it a press release and they put it out in the magazines like Autocar and whatever else, they published always a photograph of the car that just been sold to the Maharaj of Jaipur or somebody or the other with these specifications, this Rolls Royce, with this model, this coach built. Because each time they managed to sell a car to a Maharaja and they got the kind of exposure and publicity that gave them, they were sold 10 and more cars to other people in other parts of the world. So to that extent, India was a very important market for all these manufacturers but not necessarily very large in terms of, in terms of numbers, it wasn't very significant. So I would kind of, that's one other thing I want to clarify. And to say that we have had, I mean, there's no doubt about the fact that India uh, is now an important automotive manufacturing nation and, our, and the history of the automobile. In fact, we have gone and the Indian manufacturers have gone and bought some brands like, as, you, as we know, Mahindra has gone and bought Norton the motorcycle brand in the UK, which was one of the oldest brands, one of the great motorcycle brands historically. Similarly, TVS has gone and bought BSA. Again, the same story. Sorry, the other way around. TVS has bought Norton. Mahindra's bought BSA. And, uh, and, and the fact that they've gone and bought historic brands is because they realize that there is importance or usefulness in having them. Because people, when they buy a lot of the vehicles that they buy today, people, when they buy an automobile, a lot of them buy a history with it. And that history is what is important all this. And we must, I think, given that, um, I do think it's important for us in India to realize that the history of the automobile is a very much a part of our, of our history, India's history also, as much as that of the world uh, for the 20th century, and needs to be remembered and to the extent that it can be preserved to keep preserving that for the future generations and even for the future of whatever. Of course, the automobile has, there are a lot of downside to the automobile in terms of emission, pollution, congestion, et cetera. But that's another issue. And that's, that doesn't mean that we should forget and crush our past. So I think it's very important to preserve our past. So I think with that in mind, let me know, I think, I think that's enough of talking from me. Maybe I should now hand over to Suki and whether there are questions from you. Sure. Thank you so much. It was such a uh, <clears throat> visual delight as well to see these uh, beauties on the screen. Uh, I have a question before we go ahead. Where, you know, you mentioned a couple of um, uh, museums now for cars. I mean, that's something really new because we've not really had that in the past. Where else can we see, um, you know, because most of them are in private connections, right? How else do we get to have a look at them? <clears throat> Uh, well, the three museums, the four museums that I mentioned actually are not, uh, are open to the public. The one which is the Pranal Bhogilal Museum, which is called the Auto World Car Museum, a vintage car museum, which is in Katiawada near Ahmedabad, is open to the public and, and it's a very popular one. A lot of people locally do go there. Uh, a lot of the other enthusiasts have visited, made it a point to visit. It's worth visiting because the the, the range of cars there is absolutely extraordinary, not necessarily in the best of conditions, but they are terrific automobiles there with great histories. Um, on the other side, uh, the one which is in uh, Manesar, the Heritage Transport Museum, which is inside by Tarun Thakral, is completely open to the public. There are a lot of public events happening there. Uh, people do come there regularly. It's a bit away from Delhi, so it's a bit of a drive to get there, but it's really, if you're driving from uh, Delhi to Jaipur, it's worth stopping 
The one at Coimbatore GD Museum is another brilliant museum where I think uh, what uh, the, the family GD Naidu, Mr. GD Naidu has done is um, essentially put together cars which are part of the people's car movement, the people's car, really the people car for the people. And that's a thematically, all these three museums are brilliant. The one in Udaipur, which is essentially the museum uh, of the princely family of Udaipur, is um, it keeps the cars and that's open to the public. Similarly, in Dungarpur, um, the the Harshwandar Dungarpur, who is uh, who's this guy and who's a prince, who's, who's one of the, who's a descendant of the family, has put together a beautiful collection of cars and automobilia as part of the palace and which is accessible to everybody and anybody. So there are several of them which are already in the public domain, which are publicly accessible. There are many others which are private collections are being called museums and will, I hope, one day be accessible to the public. So I think there, there is a move, there is a consciousness about that. People are looking at that. And I would imagine that more and more such museums should be available to the public. There's a question from uh, Shivam and he wants to know uh, your view and your take on the uh, electric vehicles. Well, um, the electric vehicle, I mean, personally, I think it is, um, it's it's probably one of the futures. I won't say this is the only future. I think we 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 the government tends to make. Um, I'm I'm a bit surprised by the way the government behaves. Not just the Indian, but it, but it, at the moment I would say the same thing applies even to some of the European governments. Is that um, the fact that we need to have zero emission? We need to uh, the fact that emission is a uh, and and climate change is a big issue. There's no doubt about that. And I completely agree that um, no doubt automobiles is a major contributor to that aspect. And that has to, um, and, and that needs to be addressed. So how do you address it? So you have to obviously now make sure that in the future, all vehicles that are made should ideally have zero emission or close to zero emission. And now how do you achieve the zero emission is something that should, I would think is, should be the objective set by the government. And then you should leave it to the manufacturers to then figure out how to get to that. So that then to define that it has to be electric is a bit ridiculous and silly because there is a lot of other alternative technologies that are being worked upon and being developed and could look at changing that. So the point remains is that um, I think to say that electric vehicles is the future is, uh, is for the moment seems to be so, but it's always be presumptuous. You can always have some kind of a landmark, I don't know, some breakthrough technology somewhere else, something changes, hydrogen becomes more easily accessible, becomes easier to manage and something happens. And then suddenly you realize that um, battery driven electric vehicles are not the only solution, but yes, it's the future. Uh, it, it, it is in terms of historic, it's as in historic because you could, you have to remember that in 1900, in the year 1900, the electric vehicle, by the way, the electric vehicle automobile precedes the IC engine, the petrol driven vehicle. The first petrol driven vehicle was the Benz patent wagon as people know from 1886. Um, bit controversial because there was other IC vehicles before that, but well, Benz have kind of you know, hijacked the history. But before that, in 1871, was the first electric vehicle. And people forgot about that. Forget They tend to forget about that. Volkswagen make it a point to come out with a replica of that vehicle to just score that point. But in the year 1900, more than 30%, more than a third of the vehicles which were being made and sold were electric. And in fact, the fastest vehicle, the land speed record, held by the first vehicle in the world in 1900, which did 100 kilometers per hour, was an electric vehicle. So there's already a history of electric vehicles. So a historic vehicle can be electric too. And today a Tesla, a Tesla Model S, the sports car, which was made about 10, 12 years ago, in another 20 years would be a historic vehicle. So yes, electric has very much has its place. I, I am completely, uh, I do see a lot of advantages and um, I have driven several and I would say that they're, they're they can be exciting cars. They don't make any sound, but the rest of it all in terms of acceleration, ability, everything else is excellent. So I'm not um, I'm not against electric at all. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, someone who goes by the name of B says that a more a statement than a question, but India got its first double decker in Calcutta in 1926, Walford and Company. And uh, Amreen Hussain uh, mentions uh, our questions. Is it correct to call HM Contessa the Indian Mustang? Um, uh, Amreen, yes, um, that depends. I mean, you know, the Mustang, uh, 
uh, was uh, what it meant in India, uh, what it meant to the U.S. market or at that point in time, I think is uh, the significance is a bit different in the sense that um, uh, is that fact that uh, in U.S., as you know, was the world's largest uh, car market uh, and uh, until, until China overtook that. But for most of the last hundred years, it was the world's largest car market. And it was obviously a market for big cars, big four-door sedans, etc., and then in 1964, Ford came up with a car called the Mustang, which was a, not a four-door sedan, but a two-door coupe. And before you knew, it became a huge seller. In fact, in that year, it was one of the best-selling cars. Over 64, 65, it was one of the best-selling cars, the best-selling car in the US. Better selling than a four-door sedan. So that, I think, has its own significance. And I'm not sure whether the Hindustan Contessa, in that sense, has the same significance. It doesn't. In terms of its looks, because it has a look which are more American than anything else, uh, it has been likened to a Mustang or likened to what you call an American pony car. But I think the, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's still a four-door sedan. It wasn't a two-door coupe. And the day a two-door coupe or a two-door convertible becomes one of the big sellers in the world, I would call that then the equivalent of the Mustang. The Mustang remains the world's uh, best-selling sports car through time. Rahul uh, asks about this very popular story that does around that the Indian Maharajas used to use their Rolls Royces to carry animal foil. <clears throat> Is there any truth to that? No, not at all. Unfortunately, not at all. There are too many myths. Uh, we, we, I think we Indians love stories. So I think uh, churning out stories is one of the, well, the best part. I mean, that's, that's part of folklore. That's part of our, uh, whatever it is, our, our whole history. And um, and, and to say that uh, Maharaja went to this showroom and um, and was miffed and then went and bought these Rolls Royces and turned them into garbage vehicles. It's a wonderful story, which has been ascribed to just about every other Maharaja today. But it's there is just no evidence of it. Just no evidence that we have been able to find, one has been able to find that Rolls has come up with, or anybody has come up with. I think it's just another of those stories, but uh, what, what a story to tell anybody anyway. Um. Abhinav uh, has a question. Uh, he wants to know that uh, apparently Savai Man Singh, one of Jaipur, once bought an expensive car for his wife, Gayatri Devi, while traveling in France, presumably. And is this true? And uh, what happened to that car? And any more information about that? <clears throat> well, it is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is one of the few stories which is very true. <laughs> Uh, in fact, they were niece, if I'm not mistaken, at the time of the honeymoon or something. Or not honeymoon. This would have been probably after. Or was it the honeymoon? But anyway, it was a niece that they were there and um, they were on the street somewhere passing by. And this Jaguar passed by and she said, wow, what the hell is, what is that? That's so beautiful. And um, it, the story goes that the next day or maybe the day after, whatever it was, you know, when um, Gayatri Devi woke up, um, Man Singhton said, okay, why don't you come? There's something for you. And opened the door and outside there was this Jaguar XK120 that he had bought her. Wow. And that car still remains in the family. And the car remained with uh, Gaitu Devi till she passed away and still remains in the family. Yes, that's, that's, that, that true story is not really very true. I think it's one of those, one of those real stories that make up some, why, why we all, why Indians from all walks of life have loved Aurangabhi. Lovely. Uh, Lisa John says, uh, Mr. Sen, in 50 years or so from today, will there be a car or a scooter or a moped or a bicycle uh, that will be celebrated the way these old gems are being celebrated? Oh, yes. No doubt about that. I think so, because um, uh, I think each period, each time there are cars and vehicles and automobiles which have kind of reflected the times. Uh, the Tesla as an example, I mean, we're talking about electric and I can imagine that Tesla, which is, uh, uh, which uh, people have a love-hate relationship to, uh, and the fact that today, a lot of the people who own and buy, who bought Teslas, who own uh, Teslas, obviously are crazy about it. They love the car. As much as many of the, uh, many of the old people like us, the old generation, older generation like us who are into historic vehicles would say, oh, the Tesla, we dismiss it and say, this is, this is, this is rubbish. This is not a car. The fact of the matter remains that the Tesla is very significant for this period. We are going through a major change in technology in the automobile sphere. We don't know which way it's going to go, but whatever the, the fact is that the Teslas 
do make a significant sale. I would imagine 10, 5, 20, 30 years later, we'll wake up and say, hey, these Teslas were very significant and important. Similarly, Royal Enfield, the Royal Enfield Bullet, which has been in the Indian streets for Indian roads for 40, 50, 70 years and still carries on as it is, itself has its own significance. Or the Tata Nano, mm. which I think was a very, very, it's a brilliant idea. It's a different issue of the execution of whatever went wrong. But there was a fact that there was, a, it was a significant part of India's automotive history at the end of the day. One day people, very soon, people are already waking up to the fact that you need to save whatever nanos are there because they're going to be part of India's, uh, part of our history anyway. So true. Uh, on the mention of na nanos, uh, Sabira Fernandez reminds you that you missed saying uh, that the Tatas bought the Jaguar. How could you not say that, she says. But I think you were on the verge of saying that and then you skipped. Well, the Tatas bought the Jaguars, uh, that, that's a different part of history. But of course, that's, that, that, that is, um, you know, it's not part of the romance of uh, Gayatri Devi. And I'm, I wonder what she had to say when the Tatas went and bought Jaguar. In fact, it's an interesting point is that's where I do think it's important or interesting to connect. And, and I'm not sure, I, I don't think I've come across Tatas kind of, let's say, Capitalizing on the fact that the that Gaitri Devi's you know Jaguar being there or part of the history when it when they when they launched Jaguar in India, in fact when they launched Jaguar in India, um, I was there for the launch which was in Mumbai at the Radio Club. I was there that evening. They did bring a couple of Jaguars, older Jaguars, there on display, but um, I'm afraid that uh, there is a problem there. They didn't bring the right car. And that is where I do think that it's important to know your history. And maybe they messed up there, but let's not get into that. Okay. <clears throat> Abhinav says, what was the diversity like in the earlier, early racing era? Was there presumably, uh, there was presumably a woman driver in the first race from Calcutta to Barrackpore. Yeah, I think we didn't talk about racing cars at all, but is there any, was there a woman driver? Not to the best of my knowledge, whether there was a woman driver for the 1904 event, uh, there were women there. I mean, clearly it was more like a picnic. They stopped at uh, at uh, the Tagore family's estate, uh, not the not the Rabindranath Tagore side, or the cousin side, the, the the princely side. So they had a they had a tea break, and uh, and then they crossed. So it was a bit of a casual event, and I'm not. There must have been women in you know in the in the entourage. But not necessarily driving and not aware of the first woman who's supposed to have driven a car in India was um, Lady uh, Tata, one of the from the Tata family in Bombay, in Mumbai, in fact, at that point of time in Bombay. Um, and there have been, but in India, in terms of women for racing, I think I would imagine Mini Pan and there was um, Lisa Lumsdane in Calcutta in the 50s. Uh, and 60s who were racing cars. Uh, before that, uh, I'm not that well aware, but internationally, in, obviously in Europe and other parts, uh, people were into, women were into racing very early in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, there is famous Helen Nies and, and there's Elizabeth Eunuch who drove all the way, who's a Czech, um, uh, she was from, from the Czech Republic, who drove all the way from France in a Bugatti all the way to India. Oh, wow. Two Bugattis, and which they sold those two Bugattis before she went back. She said, till she didn't sell those cars, she wouldn't go back. So she drove all the way. And and Elizabeth Eunuch was one of the great uh, racing drivers of that period and uh, was as quick and quicker than the men. And of course, in more recent times, there's Michel Muto, who I think most of our generation who went to cars in the, in, into, in the 70s and 80s were probably in love with her. Uh, Michel um, was almost a world champion. She lost to the world championship with just a point where, unfortunately, she had an accident, uh, and um, and and she lost it. But otherwise, she was almost a world champion, rallying world champion, and remains one of the greats. So I think women. I don't think there is. Um, I mean, women can be as good, if not better. It's just that the, there are probably fewer women who are interested in racing than men. That's about it. Otherwise, today there are as um, they. I don't see. It's a question of skills. It's nothing to do with physical abilities. So at the end of the day. They can be as good, if not better. And they're, they're safer drivers. Let's be sure about that. Thank you. 
Lisa would like to know whether the cars being built to uh, are the cars today uh, are the cars being built to last many many years so with it so that we can call them vintage or they're being made to be efficient so that they're too flimsy to last uh well that's a very interesting point and that uh, that's a debate by itself there are actually two kinds of cars being made let's put it that way or rather they have been throughout let's take an example of uh, there's this great debate amongst enthusiasts was of let's say the german cars versus the japanese cars and for that i would quote my taxi my favorite taxi driver in paris in the sense that i have i used to have a regular taxi guy a gentleman who was from portugal but who who's gone back to portugal now that he's retired but he had a fleet of cars and every time i needed a taxi i would call him mr barocas so mr barocas's point was he used to keep experimenting and because we were he was going into cars we used to keep buying Uh, you know mercedes benz is bmw then toyotas and give explain his exp- uh, let's say his experience the point was the japanese cars like the toyotas were extremely reliable and they're really really terrific in terms of reliability but they didn't last that long you see in 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 europe in france at least in paris the rules are that you can you can have a taxi up to 7 years old and beyond 7 you can't you can't have a taxi you have to sell it off so in 7 years old seven, in 7 years typically the taxi would do almost half a million kilometers and uh, according to mr barocas these toyotas which did almost half a million kilometers had very gave virtually no trouble no problems at all but at the end when he had to go and resell that car he could get no value for them because by that time the body etc was a little bit more the more fragile cars and for 5 years 7 years they drove by very well but then after that they come apart whereas the german cars the mercedes benzes that he had had uh, were giving gave much more trouble more problems in the in the in, and it cost more money to let's say run but then after the seven years the value he got for it was much much higher when he sold it off to he would drive it back to portugal and sell them off to people in portugal who bought them and paid much more simply because they survived much better because they had the build quality to last longer So this is a question of manufacture to manufacture it varies. Some manufacturers put in that much to make those cars last that much longer. Others are looking at uh, different, uh, let's say, situation. An example is in Japan, for instance. Um, uh, after five years, if you up to five years, you can keep a car. Beyond five years, um, let's say the government regulations make it very difficult for you to keep a car. Uh, you have to go through these MOTs or what are called the tests every other year, and that's really tough. and so they make it difficult so the result is that the japanese manufacturers have always said that okay for 5 years they should have a car which is, should give no problems beyond 5 years what happens is less of their concern whereas in europe in a country like sweden an average age of a car is 16 years and there you know uh, you need cars to really survive so when volvos make cars they make them to survive in a longer term so there is you know the differences in terms of uh countries and in terms of manufacturers and their attitude to how they develop the car okay behram and many other people have complimented shivam would also like to know if you can shed light on the future of vehicles and what are other possible alternatives other than well the alternative to vehicles of course i mean vehicles uh, alternative is is zoom meetings right we don't travel anymore now we travel to we talk to each other i can i can chat with anybody in anywhere else in the world at uh, you know and be able to see the person when we are talking i think that in itself is an quite an alternative and um, and that's going to that's changing i'm sure people are traveling much less than they were pre 19 pre 2020 pre you know 2019 i think the number of kilometers all of you must have covered compared to what you're going this year i'm sure there's a big difference in that uh the other alternative of course to vehicles is the fact vehicles i mean when we talk of vehicles it includes obviously buses and all that so i do believe i have a i have i do believe that public transport is very important and no doubt for big cities and everything i think public transport is an is a, is an essential and in that in many of the indian cities or indian uh, indian indian government in many parts of the world, of the country in many cities has failed we could do much better mumbai is probably the public transport is one of the better ones calcutta is quite decent delhi is could be much better bangalore is a disaster for instance and i do think that that's also the problem even in in the rest of the world in the us uh, except for new york i think most of the us public transport is terrible 
So there's no option. So what do you do? You have to have cars. If you have to move around, if you have to survive, if you live in the countryside in France, if you, you cannot imagine doing a job if you didn't have a public transport, if you didn't have your own transport, I mean to say. So what is the alternative? So the point is that, okay, in the future, there'll be shared cars and shared vehicles. You don't have to own your vehicle anymore. And which, which means, which has its advantages. And at the same time, um, these are vehicles which are, let's say, heartless vehicles, vehicles without, uh, you know, without a soul, because you you just get into them, get to the point, get off. Whereas it's not the same thing as owning one, and you know, and 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 calling and giving it a name, and and having its having your own little love affair with that little automobile of yours. That's changing, and that will change. Uh, at the same time, I'm I would think that um, there could be a, I mean, there's space for everybody and everything, and every situation. So automobiles will remain. I think a significant part of our lives, at least for the next few decades, what will happen? I mean, later on, maybe we can transport ourselves without an automobile from, I don't know, I could be in Mumbai and meet you face to face. I think it's possible. Beam me up. <clears throat> so Abhina uh, would like to know why India, in spite of having a rich history of racing, lags behind when it comes to modern motorsports. Ah. That is another topic by itself. <laughs> I think that's that that is that's an issue of I think we have to look at ourselves and see what that where the hell do we where have we messed up? We had Formula One, we have had world championship events, we have had one of the best rallies ever in the world could have been was the Himalayan rally. And so we have had some great events happening at different points in time. We have had racing in India uh, long before anywhere else in Asia. And yet we don't somehow manage to do things. Or to, we had the, the Formula One is a good example. We did get it. We kept it for barely. We managed to keep it for hardly a few years and it's gone. We had this Rodil Trophy Motorcycle World Championship that came to India in the 1990s, early 1990s. And within two years or three years, we lost it. So that's, that's I think, to do with our management. There's something about us. That's, that's our problem. It's, there's something wrong with us or the way we manage things or way we organize ourselves where we... Uh, we, we, we managed to get something and then we are not able to hold on to it. And I think for that, you, that, 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 that is a, that's a different point or a different question or a different thing to debate with, 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 uh, with uh, people and the fact that I, I think the biggest problem we have as Indians and we have seen is the fact that I think we tend to fight with each other too much. And we have always our differences and political issues and, you know, internecine warfare, let's say war, uh, battles by which we destroy things that we are in, we are not able to build institutions, and that's a that's another matter altogether. Sad. Uh, Commander Mohan Narayan would like to know whether the surplus military vehicles that were available in plenty post World War II in our country influence our automobile industry. Our uh, automobile industry? No, I don't think it influenced our industry because our industry came from a system of, um, let's say the licensing in the industrial act or the licensing Raj as we call it, the industrial act that was conceived by someone like Dr. Marlon Obis and, and of course, Chawala Nehru and, 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 his, and his ministers, um, which was to do with the fact that I think in that sense, what where it's very it's a, it's a it's a it's a huge subject by itself and it's quite an interesting thing the fact that if you look at 1950 where did india stand in terms of ma manufacturing of cars vis-a-vis -vis japan south korea brazil and australia and different parts of the world and china let's say today we have china japan india uh, G germany south korea now where were these countries in 1950 and where are they today and what happened and so if you look at it in 1950, basically South Korea didn't make any cars at all. Japan made fewer cars than India. China made no cars at all, right? Whereas Brazil and Australia made a lot of cars. Australia was a major, was a significant car making nation for many years. Today, they don't make a single car. Brazil's automobile industry is, is collapsing, disappearing. And I think it's a matter of time before it disappears probably, right? Whereas India is where it is behind China, behind Japan, that's right. But it's ahead of Korea, which didn't make all that. So what happened? So basically, I think the fact that there is an industrial policy that said, okay, there will be protection and that we will not let multinationals flourish, that we will let Indian companies actually make it. They restricted to only three licenses and not many more. 
also give them some kind of, let's say, they survived. If they had probably given it to anybody and everybody, would they have survived? So that's a question mark. So you can go back and we can keep discussing them time and again. But in, to give you an example, in Japan, in the 50s, the Japanese industry company uh, government decided that it would be a free for all for the motorcycle industry. Anybody can come and make motorcycles and whatever. And at one point of time in Japan, there were more than 50 motorcycle manufacturers and only four survived. And only four survived. They were much more restrictive with cars, with cars that had the same system as India. They gave licenses. They didn't let anybody and everybody get into it. And today, Japan has a, as you know, as many as seven, eight car manufacturers. India has three, has two brands, Tatas and Mahindras. It's thanks to the fact that the kind of policy is taken. Australia, there was a brand called Holden. Have you heard of it? It's dead. Brazil has any brands of its own? Doesn't. So I think um, we did not. I mean, there's a tendency to criticize everything that was done in the 50s and 60s and you know, all our problems are with whatever, whatever. But the fact of the matter remains that in hindsight, probably some of the policies weren't that bad. And, um, and but in terms of the in, impact of this vehicle so the second world war to what war became the Indian industry, no, I don't think there's much of a connection. Those were mostly, you know, Fords were assembled and there were Jeeps and there were light trucks. And what Tata went and did was something else. And what Hindustan Motors or Premier Automobiles did was something else. So um, <clears throat> Shivam is back with the question on Tata Nano. Uh, and what's your take on its failure? Well, I would say it's more to do with marketing than anything else. Really, the product, in my opinion, wasn't that bad. There were some shortcomings and uh, probably uh, needed uh, to, let's say, uh, could have been addressed, but in terms of its, um, its uh, let's say the, the, the reason why it went wrong was uh, the kind of image it took on as being the world's cheapest car, and um, and the fact that uh, uh, whatever it is in India, I think we buy an automobile, it's an important status symbol, and to kind of say the oh I bought the world's cheapest car um, was obviously was not necessarily something that people. Uh, were willing to admit or accept. In, in, in fact, if at all, Tata, the Tata Nano might have been more successful in other markets and other parts of the world. And I, I, I've heard of people in France, friends of mine, who say, oh, once the Nano comes to France, we want to buy that because we need a very basic car. We don't need all these ones with all these electronic gadgetry. And they, were, they would have been probably the, uh, the more appropriate clientele for the car than the ones in India. So I think they're in marketing terms, I think it was a bit messed up. You could have done something different. Too. Yeah. <clears throat> Lisa says that there's a restaurant in Delhi called Chor Bazaar uh, in Old Delhi and uh, has a vintage looking car and the food is served uh, or you know, has a grand dining table on it. Can you imagine bringing a vintage car away from a museum to life like that? <clears throat> Well, uh, uh, Lisa, the Chor Bazaar one is a long history. It's been there like that, that car, I think, for some 30-odd 30, 30 years now or so. So I think, um, no, I, I mean, whether I could imagine, no. But I can imagine having a car on display if I had the space in, in my living room. So it could become a display. In fact, quite a few people, um, we, we had a talk yesterday and somebody was showing his motorcycle, which was on display in his bedroom. So, so you have, yeah, people are crazy enough to do silly things. So why not a car, um, you know, being used at, in a restaurant for display? There, there is, um, at the moment in the Paris um, airport, in one of the terminals, there's a Citroen 2 CV in display with all kinds of gifts around it uh, for, uh, with, with Christmas coming up, it's there. I think, uh, uh, yeah, you know, historic vehicles make terrific, uh, they're visually delightful. So to use them as a tool for marketing or to bring in clientele, why not? And uh, <clears throat> Jehan would like to know what your opinion is on people electrifying vintage cars like the Phantom, for example. The, uh, electrifying vintage cars and the Phantom, I'm sorry. Uh, the Phantom, there is a... Um, um, I, I think if, if what Jehan is referring to is a is the new Phantom, it's a new Rolls Royce Phantom, the electric version, or is he referring to? Uh, no, he's saying brand? that if you were to take a vintage car and then uh, you know make it an electric version. Uh, okay. That uh, the, 
this one, this is, there's a very clear, uh, as a part of FIVA, the international body, there's a very clear line on this. And that is that, uh, what does a car, a car is made up of essentially uh, two main elements. One is the, the engine, that's the heart of the car, that's a heart. And then there's the body, which is the, like the body of a person. And, uh, you know, and, and in fact, when you identify any, any vehicle, uh, for registration, regulation purpose or whatever, you always have an engine number and a chassis number. And that's what makes a historic vehicle. That a vehicle, which is from 1923, has an engine and a chassis from 1923. Now, if you go and put an electric motor to it, a brand new motor, or even a brand new IC engine to it, a uh, normal petrol engine to it, a brand new one, it's no more a historic vehicle. So if you put an electric motor today to a vehicle, which is from 1923, it's no more historic because you've changed one of the most important element of the vehicle, that's a heart, the engine itself, right? So if you've changed that, it's no more historic. In that case, as far as we are concerned, I'm concerned, no, it's not historic anymore. You want to do it, you have every right to do it. Each individual should have every right to do what he wants to do. That's what democracy is all about. That to have the, as long as you don't contravene the laws of the land, because at the same time, when you have, when you have kind of get a vehicle homologated, and which means homologation means you've got it uh, certified for its period engine and trans and, and, and body. It means the car was designed, let's say a car came out 20 years ago, came out in 2002 and had a certain engine and transmission matching and that had been certified. Now you go and change the engine, you need to recertify it. And so all these people who go and electrify the vehicles, what is the regulation for that? If the government is very strict about regulations otherwise, why are they allowing that? And so that, that's a different issue anyway. But what the point is that once you go and put an electric motor into a vehicle, it's no more a historic vehicle. If you're doing it to an old vehicle, it's not historic any longer. Uh, but then again, if you somebody wants to do it on his own and, and wants to run it that way, and then saying that 10 years later, 20 years later, wants to take it back to the original engine and transmission, why not? Um, <clears throat> Girish would like to know if the Rolls made a supercharged car for the Jaipur royal family. No, no, no. It's again one of many myths and stories that does does around. Not at all. No. Okay. Donald has an interesting uh, question. He'd like you to speak a little bit about the restoration of cars and how one finds the rare spare parts. Uh, okay, spare. That's that's a complicated question in the sense that. Spare parts, of course, depends. There is a fairly large business, or let's say industry, behind making spares for historic vehicles. And, um, and in some cases, in many cases, the manufacturer themselves are as much involved. So today, if you have um, the Ford Mustang was used, Ambreen mentioned about the Mustang. Uh, Ford Mustang today, you can find each and every part of the Mustang anywhere easily, uh, at least the ones from the 1960s and the early 1970s. Uh, there is a whole industry behind that. In fact, uh, there is somebody I know in Chandigarh who's making a whole lot of parts for the Mustang and for the Corvette, uh, the Chevrolet Corvette, and exporting it to the US. So you can, there are certain cars and certain uh, vehicles for which parts are quite easily available because the numbers are large. In many cases, the manufacturer themselves are supporting it or are also providing the parts. Uh, Mercedes-Benz, BMW, uh, Porsche, all these companies actually get parts made, they don't make it themselves. They get it made in wherever it could be, sometimes in case of Taiwan, China, India, Sri Lanka makes a lot of parts. And uh, then making it available, they obviously have their quality standards and they're making it available through their, their so-called classic vehicle divisions. So in many cases, you can get parts. In the other cases, in the rarer vehicles or the rarer situation, uh, you need to fabricate. And uh, for that, in, in fact, India is a great place to fabricate and get vehicles fabricated or get parts fabricated. And most of the restoration shops and facilities in India, they're very good at that. And they do manage to fabricate a lot of the parts uh, here anyway. <clears throat> great, so there've been a lot of, uh, okay. Rahul has another question. What is the criteria for a vehicle to be classified as vintage? Uh, see, vintage is a very specific word. Vintage um, is an English usage. Vintage, as you know, is originally a French word, which applies to wine, nothing to do with cars. Uh, the English, of course, decided to use it for anything that is a bit old. And uh, of course, uh, when it comes to the English definition of vintage, uh, 
Um, they defined cause, the English defined cause as um, cause which are pre-1904 are called veterans from 1904 to 1918, 1919 is called uh, Edwardian. And then from 1919 to, nine, to 1930 are vintage. And after that is post vintage. So vintage, if you take that word, the English word, it's a very narrow classification. And in different parts of the world, they have different, I mean, the Americans like to use the word classics or antiques. Um, and then in, in uh, Germany, you have old timers and you have young timers. From FIBA, from the Fe International Federation, we have decided to be for, for a while now, we've been calling all vehicles which are more than 30 years old as historic vehicles. So there's not a differentiation between vintage and this and that. We don't go into classification. So any vehicle that's more than 30 years old, is a historic vehicle. So any vehicle that was built before 1992 is a historic vehicle. Next year, any vehicle which was built before 1993 is a historic vehicle. And that's how we, I think that's probably the best way to kind of define the whole thing. Okay, Lisa has a question as to if you have any thoughts on why a car is a she and not a he. I, I, I personally, I don't find, uh, I, I don't see cars as he or she. I don't understand why do people have this obsession about calling the cars, whatever she is and he, and he's or she or whatever. It's a funny thing. It's a, probably a language factor, Lisa. You should be able to tell us maybe that um, I think languages like French or Hindi, where um, uh, whether, whether you know, all words are masculine or feminine, uh, they're, not, they're not too many neuter. Uh, new, uh, new to gender. So, so, so I think there's a tendency to probably think of cars as being she in these languages. In English, in the English language, they should be neutral. They're neither he or not she. And for me, a car is neither. It's it's an object. It's it's an object of desire, but it's an object nonetheless. A car and a home, both. Yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, so I think that brings us to an end uh, to this delightful session. Uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for that lovely engagement and for that lovely presentation and uh, have a wonderful Saturday and a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in and for your uh, very interesting questions. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thank you.